Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shaina Damija from Arijit Kere Group, Iser Mohali, India. I'll be talking about real time tracking of coherent vibrational motion in ground and excited electronic state and its implications in biology. So, the motivation behind doing this work is excited state charge transfer, fluorescent proteins, which are an uh, indispensable biomarking uh, tools nowadays. So first fluorescent protein was uh, obtained from jellyfish Aquaria Victoria, and then several uh, uh, mutants were engineered. It consists of a chromophoric unit, which resides inside the beta barrel as shown here. And the chromophoric unit is formed by an autocatalytic reaction between three amino acids. So uh, it fluoresces basically via excited state proton transfer as shown here from the chromophoric unit shown in blue to an acceptor amino acid via the hydrogen bonding network. And once uh, it, the, it undergoes excited state proton transfer, it forms the deprotonated form, which fluoresces. So this uh, energy level diagram here shows the photocycle in uh, such proteins, which uh, have excited state proton transfer process followed by fluorescence and then a ground state proton transfer back to the ground state. Upon photo excitation to a higher lying electronic state, it can also undergo photo conversion. While uh, it is, uh, uh, it can be easily uh, studied that uh, about the photo cycle and photo conversion uh, time scales using uh, techniques like fluorescence lifetime and uh, pump probe spectroscopy, it is quite important to pinpoint how vibrations control such charge transfer processes. On the other hand, there are many uh, small molecule, uh, molecule systems where uh, electron transfer processes happen. And while such electron transfer is happening, the molecule undergoes uh, structural changes like twisting or isomerization. So it is uh, important to pinpoint specific vibrations which lead to such a charge transfer and uh, what causes a particular uh, deactivation uh, channel. So first of all, I'll be uh, talking about the photophysics of fluorescent proteins, which exist predominantly in the anionic form. Uh, the first protein which I'll be talking about is a yellow fluorescent protein called uh, Venus, where we found that uh, there is a dual emission uh, kind of behavior in this protein, showing emission from both LE state and the uh, relaxed state. While in case of wild type GFP, such an emission from LE state is uh, quite uh, low, it is feeble, uh, which could be because of the unique nature of potential energy surface in uh, this uh, protein, which we started. And another thing which we uh, started is a photo conversion in an enhanced GFP where we saw that upon illumination with UV uh, radiation, it shows a new uh, fluorescence uh, lifetime component, which uh, keeps on the amplitude for which keeps on increasing upon UV illumination, while the amplitude for the already uh, existing fluorescence lifetime keeps on decreasing. And then upon uh, analyzing the absorption and fluorescence kinetics and fitting it with uh, analytic models, we could find out the time scales for photoconversion. Then upon doing a global fluorescence lifetime analysis, we could see that the photo converted EGFP form uh, kept on increasing while the amplitude for the EGFP, which was the originally existing form, kept on decreasing. Uh, we also found out that these two forms were uh, spectrally uh, inseparable and the fluorescence spectrum was uh, overlapping in the two forms. So we could distinguish them based upon their uh, fluorescence lifetimes. Uh, while, uh, we could uh, study the photo, uh, photophysics of uh, such proteins. It is uh, also important to ask uh, certain questions. And uh, those are that uh, the structural changes and the intermediates which are involved in such charge transfer processes and what is the effect of environment and also what specific vibrational modes lead to a particular uh, deactivation channel. So uh, there have been uh, studies on uh, a few of such uh, proteins. And one of those is a photoactive yellow protein, which has been uh, studied by Tahi Tahara's uh, group. And uh, they have employed a technique called time-resolved uh, impulsive stimulated Raman scattering. Uh, and the, uh, this plot here uh, shows the vibrations in the excited state. And these are changing as the system evolves on the excited state while it undergoes uh, conformational changes from trans to the uh, cis form. 
so uh, first of all i would like to uh, discuss how to uh, track the origin of vibrations meaning whether these are arising from the ground state or these are arising from the excited state uh, in order to understand this first of all we need to understand the photon picture of uh, electric field uh, of light matter interaction where uh, basically uh, one photon is absorbed and another photon is emitted in case of uh, rayleigh scattering these two are same while in case of raman scattering which could be either stoke shifted or anti stoke shifted uh, th this could emerge uh, stoke shifted as compared to the incoming radiation or anti stoke shifted while in case of uh, fluorescence it is a stoke shift but the energy level is a, a, a high, is an electronic level and not a virtual level as uh, there in uh, case of raman scattering so uh, while this photon picture is uh, familiar to uh, all of us uh, it does not give us any information about how the macroscopic polarization was created and what is the order of the process that we are looking at and that is why it is quite important to understand the electric field picture so these are the electric field pictures for all these processes which i have shown here where rayleigh scattering has one electric field interaction followed by uh, the emission of the signal Uh, while in case of uh, raman scattering which is stokes here there are two electric field uh, interactions creating the vibrational wave packet in the ground state followed by a third uh, electric field interaction which basically interrogates it and then the signal is emitted it can also be anti stoke shifted as uh, shown here in case of fluorescence two electric field interactions uh, create a population in the excited state and then fluorescence uh, is there while uh, this is the uh, energy level uh, picture this can also be understood using double sided feynman diagrams where uh, there could be an interaction from the bra or the ket side of the density uh, matrix and uh, showing uh, the same processes here so after having uh, understood uh, about this uh, all the schematics which i uh, showed you involve three electric field interactions so it is a third order nonlinear uh, spectroscopy so suppose you have uh, an experimental setup of this kind where all the interactions are coming from three different uh, pulses so the signal will be emitted in the fourth corner and hence it is called a box cast geometry and the signal is emitted in minus k1 plus k2 plus k3 uh, direction so uh, uh, in cases where the first two interactions come from the same pump the signal will be emitted in the direction of the probe which is basically called the pump probe geometry it is a two beam geometry so uh, all the uh, things that i showed you here uh, were about uh, raman scattering but now i will tell you what is the difference between uh, spontaneous and stimulated raman scattering in case of spontaneous raman scattering the second electric field interaction comes from the vacuum field while in case of stimulated raman scattering this second electric field interaction comes from the uh, external field so in case of srs which was uh, developed by botfeld and geller the two uh, pulses are temporally overlapped in time while the raman pump is a picosecond pump and it is stretched in time domain it interacts twice with the system so the interaction e1 and e3 come from the raman pump and the second interaction comes from the white light probe and then the signal is emitted while there is another technique called uh, impulsive stimulated raman scattering where the first two interactions come from the raman pump creating the vibrational coherence in the ground state and then the probe interrogates it so the necessary condition here is that the time, uh, temporal duration of the raman pump should be much shorter as compared to the oscillations we want to look at so there is a spectrally dispersed uh, version of this technique which is isrs it is called stisrs uh, which i'll be uh, showing in the next slides and uh, it has several advantages over these techniques so uh, as i told you the srs technique has contributions from um, any unwanted signals because the pulses are uh, overlapped in time but the signal is there over the entire spectrum in case of isrs the signal is only there at the spectral wings because because uh, there is huge rayleigh scattering while there is no background fluorescence and all the range of vibrations from 0 to 4000 wave number can be covered if a very short pulse is used less than 7 femtoseconds and in case of uh, spectrally dispersed isrs it has all the advantages of uh, these techniques so uh, this is the data for a solvent which i am showing here 
uh, it is for chloroform and after her data analysis uh, we could get three uh, chloroform uh, modes which are uh, shown here these are raman active uh, vibrations of chloroform then uh, while doing such an experiment uh, using a solute and a solvent uh, we could get many many uh, uh, signals and there can be many many pathways which will uh, contribute which i am summarizing here so the first two are, is the are uh, correspond to the non resonant contribution of the solvent and uh, the in outgoing uh, signal can emerge either red shifted or blue shifted as compared to the probe wavelength while there can be many resonant contributions as well as shown in the blue box so the uh, uh, the coherence can be created in the either in the ground state as shown here or it can be created in the ground uh, in the excited state so uh, and uh, we can also observe population dynamics and on top of that population dynamics we will see coherent oscillations which we want to uh, like get so uh, in this uh, case a ground state will be stimulated emission and esa and on top of that coherent vibrations will be uh, there so if we uh, observe uh, oscillations in the se band or the esa band then these can be assigned to the excited state vibrations for that particular molecule if we get it in the gsb band these can be assigned to the ground state for that uh, molecule which is under study so uh, the data which i am showing here is for a simple molecule uh, which is uh, a diatomic molecule iodine dissolved in carbon tetrachloride and uh, these are the uh, time domain uh, oscillations which we observed and after uh, fourier transform we got five uh, raman active modes out of which the first two correspond to iodine and the uh, last three correspond to the solvent so the first one is the excited state mode for iodine and the second one is the ground state mode for uh, iodine and the rest three are solvent modes we could also see that there is a node uh, in this particular vibrational mode which is for iodine and uh, the there is a phase flip around this wavelength which is the absorption uh, maxima for this particular molecule so uh, that is why we, uh, we can easily assign it to the ground state mode and this one can be assigned to the excited state uh, vibrations we also observed that there was a recurrence uh, feature for uh, this uh, data set uh, which uh, we didn't know whether we should uh, assign to the vibrational wave package revival for iodine or but then we figured out that uh, it can be assigned to the isotope logs of uh, the solvent that we were using which is uh, ccl4 and uh, there are many is isotope logs and then basically they beat against each other giving rise to such a, a recurrence feature and uh, upon uh, summing up across the regions which are marked in uh, these boxes we got a, an isrs uh, spectrum as you can see here these two modes which are shown these are quite close in uh, wave number so it is very difficult to distinguish uh, these two modes if the probe is not spectrally dispersed which is an advantage of uh, using this uh, technique as you can see here these appear at very very uh, different detection uh, wavelength of the probe as you can see here that there is a split uh, uh, line shape here Uh, and the difference is three wave numbers so three wave numbers basically corresponds to 10 picoseconds in uh, time domain and that is why we observed the recurrence feature which i showed you in the earlier slide so uh, i told you that uh, in case of uh, degenerate uh, kind of isrs uh, experiments there is a huge uh, rayleigh scattering which is uh, shown here and uh, then uh, the i told you that uh, there is an advantage of using a white light uh, probe but uh, using a chirped white light probe has an uh, additional uh, advantage which i will uh, tell here so uh, th these two schematics basically show a degenerate kind of isrs uh, experiment and the signal can emerge either red shifted or blue shifted and these two pathways contribute uh, equally while in case of a white light a uh, probe which has a, a flat spectral uh, profile so the red part of the probe and the blue part of the probe contribute a uh, uh, red part and blue part of the uh, probe they contribute equally giving rise to a signal uh, which is emitted at same detection wavelength as you can uh, see here but uh, if the probe is not chirped then this blue part and red part these will arrive at the same time then uh, these two pathways will uh, 
destructively interfere and we won't observe anything. So it is necessary uh, to have an optimal chirping of the probe to uh, get some vibrations or to enhance uh, some specific uh, vibrations. So uh, then we extended this work to polyatomic molecules where we could, we could capture uh, some of the vibrations. This is a data for Nile blue and methanol where we could capture a ring breathing mode and uh, compare it with DFT calculations uh, as well. So uh, the same technique can be extended uh, in the excited state. So whatever process I uh, described can be done in the excited state also. There will be an additional actinic pump followed by Raman pump and white light probe in order to study the structural dynamics in the excited state. And uh, right now we have been uh, doing this uh, technique and we have been implementing it on uh, these molecules. So the first one is a push-pull uh, still beam where there is an electron transfer from one end to the other end. While such electron transfer is happening, there is isomerization or twisting. So we want to know which vibrations lead to isomerization or uh, twisting in uh, this molecule. And then we'll be extending it to photoswitchable fluorescent proteins, which photoswitch upon uh, irradiation with a light of particular wavelength and the uh, chromophore also changes its conformation. And we want to track the structural dynamics. So uh, I would like to thank my lab members, Aizer Mohali and the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to deliver this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Shaina, for this uh very dense uh, talk uh, with a lot of uh, techniques. Uh, you did a lot of work. Uh, the paper is, the presentation is now open for questions from the audience, if any. As usual, you can use the chat or you can uh, just uh, switch on your microphone and ask. So I can break the eyes again. Um, when you go from iodine to null blue or more complex uh, structures, uh, is there a problem with having uh, too many modes or so too dense spectra or uh, uh, is uh, rather easy for you to, to deal with uh, three and minus six vibrational modes? Yeah, as the as we go on from diatomic to polyatomic molecules, it is uh, like difficult since there'll be many, many uh, vibrational uh, modes and then those have to be assigned. So we have to simultaneously do theoretical calculations and then assign which uh, particular modes uh, correspond to which uh, vibration. And then it becomes more complicated as the system undergoes some kind of uh, structural uh, changes as well. So yeah, it is complicated. Thanks. I see a question from Giovanni Bressana. Giovanni, can you switch on your microphone and ask the question or should I read it? Okay, uh, so I will read it. Uh, could you please expand on the white light chirp effect? Kukura show how chirped white light washes out the coherence amplitude. Have you got the, the question? So apparently uh, the white light chirp uh, washes out the coherence amplitude. Okay, okay. So uh, yeah, it has been uh, shown. But uh, also Sandy Ruman's uh, group and uh, Shaul Mukamil's uh, uh, group also have shown that it can also uh, help in enhancing some specific vibrational modes which cannot be otherwise uh, detected at all. So there has been a lot of theory. So uh, Sandy Ruman, uh, Ruman's group has uh, shown how only in the presence of chirp uh, we can observe it. As I'm uh, showing here that if this blue and the red part of the white light appear at the same time, so there is no uh, chirp in the white light probe. In uh, that case, uh, we won't detect uh, these vibrations. So uh, for some particular vibration modes, it is uh, quite uh, necessary to have optimal chirping of the probe. So it has been uh, shown. Okay. I think, uh, thank you, uh, Shaina. And uh, I think it is time to go to the next speaker, who is uh, Uriel. Uh, 
Murzana, Murzana, sorry. Uh, you talk about uh, X rays absorption signature of short uh, hydrogen bonds. Please, uh, Uriel, you have seen your screen and everything is fine. Go. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move this that it's blocking my screen. Well, anyway. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, no, well, I mean, it's a contributed talk, but yeah. I mean, for the accepting my presentation. Uh, so today I will talk about the topic that I'm very, very interested in, which is the ultra fast dynamics of uh, electrons and ions around conical intersections. And in particular, I will talk about the role uh, of the strong hydrogen bonds in determining these, uh, these dynamics. So, uh, okay. So, Conical intersections are uh, extremely important for photochemistry and photophysics. They are very, very fundamental uh, to determine what happens in photochemistry and photophysics. So basically, these are just points in the energy landscape in which we have a, a degeneracy between two or more electronic levels. So in these points, we can have a non-radiative decay, non-radiative relaxation from an excited state to a lower lying excited state or to the ground state, okay? So, of course, the presence of these conical intersections in the energy landscape determine like, a lot of what's, what's going on, what will happen in the photochemical process. So, one of the things I am very, very fascinated about is with the possibility of uh, controlling the shape and the position of conical intersection and hence controlling uh, photochemistry somehow. So today I will talk about one specific way of doing that, of approaching this idea, which is uh, by adding strong hydrogen bonds. So I will show how the presence of strong hydrogen bonds uh, can uh, modify the shape of a conical intersection and the position of a conical intersection. And then I will show some optical properties that are derived from this phenomena. Okay. But first, okay, this is more or less an overview of the talk. Okay. So first, let's uh, uh, discuss what is a strong hydrogen bond. So normally, normally we think about hydrogen bonds like. Uh, electrostatic interactions, intermolecular interactions. So for example, in the example in the screen, we have some donor that is attached to an hydrogen. And this hydrogen has some electrostatic interaction with certain acceptor, okay? And the potential energy surface projected in the hydrogen bond uh, 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 coordinate looks more or less like this. We have a deep well and another well that is not so deep, okay? But in nature, we can find uh, uh, hydrogen bonds with a wide range of strengths, and in particular, the strongest hydrogen bonds, they look much more like a three-center covalent bond than an intermolecular interaction. So they, they look more like just one single molecule than the interaction between two molecules, okay? So at the end, we have a broadened single well potential. Like in practice, this is uh, more like a broadened single well potential, okay? So very recently uh, in, in, the, in the group of Gabriel kaminsky Shriel, they observed that in some protein aggregates that were also discussed, discussed in the talk of Chakramu, uh, uh, these protein aggregates which have no aromatic residues or external uh, groups, they show certain fluorescence, some fluorescence, uh, uh, and this is somehow surprising because we normally expect that in biological matter, the fluorescence arises either from these molecules called uh, 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 aromatic uh, amino acids or from some external group here and compound is still fluorescent. So this was kind of surprising. And together with Ali Hassan Ali, they studied the molecular properties of these compounds and they observed that in, in their particular case, this, uh, this compound contain a very strong hydrogen bond network. 
Okay, these strong hydrogen bonds that I showed you before, well, they are very abundant in this combo. Okay, so in order to see if there is a connection between the non aromatic fluorescence and the presence of strong hydrogen bonds, the group at Cambridge synthesized a, 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 a crystal of L glutamine. L glutamine is just a, a non aromatic amino acid, a simple amino acid. And this crystal contains an hydrogen bond network, a network of hydrogen bonds, which are of standard strength, okay? But upon heating, they convert the L-glutamine system into something that we call L-pyroglutamine ammonium. And this L-pyroglutamine ammonium contains a very strong hydrogen bond network, okay? So both of the systems are non-aromatic. The main difference is that in the case of L-glutamine, we have a normal hydrogen bond network, in the case of L-pyroglutamine ammonium, we have a strong hydrogen bond network. As a consequence, and at variance to what happens in the case of L-glutamine, uh, in the case of L-pyroglutamine ammonium, the system is fluorescent in the visible range, okay? So in principle, this tells us that there should be a connection between the non-aromatic fluorescence and the presence of strong hydrogen bonds. But which is this connection? So, uh, together with Gonzalo Díaz Miron, who is a PhD student in Argentina, uh, so we did uh, some ab initio non adiabatic molecular dynamic simulations in which we computed the non radiative decay probability as a function of time evolution in the first excited state. And we did it for the fluorescent system, but tuning the hydrogen bond strength to different uh, 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 strengths. Basically, for example, in the, in the blue curve that you see in the screen, we have a very weak hydrogen bond, and you see that the non-radiative decay probability increases very fast during the first femtoseconds of the simulation, okay? But when we gradually increase the hydrogen bond strength, the non-radiative decay probability decreases, and when we reach the level of a strong hydrogen bond, the non-radiative decay probability is very low, and hence, the lifetime in the excited state is higher, and hence the probability of fluorescence is higher. So this shows the link between non-aromatic fluorescence and the presence of strong hydrogen bonds. So I will connect this uh, with a spectroscopy that I'm extremely fascinated about. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the first talk of the day, uh, Professor Julia Weinstein, she mentioned that uh, uh, Ultrafast X-ray spectroscopy is marking like the dawn of a new era for uh, photophysics. And I really agree with that. Uh, so I think that uh, there's many, many opportunities, uh, new opportunities. Uh, uh, if we apply uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which is uh, really, I mean, it's really a challenge, but, but there's many, many physical uh, insight that can be gained from this spectroscopy that cannot be done with, with classical uh, techniques. Uh, so we recently developed a very, very simple approach to simulate this kind of spectrum, okay? And we are also uh, currently, we are speaking with different uh, groups uh, that work in free electron lasers to be able to perform the experiments associated with the simulations that I will show you uh, in a couple of slides. But basically, these simulations are basically some sort of a motivation to, 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 for the, the things that could be able to, that we could be able to observe with an experimental uh, uh, spectrum like this. So basically, this is a pump probe technique uh, of two pulses where we have a first a, a UV pulse that excites the system to, to one of the excited states. And then we probe the system with uh, X-ray, okay? The main advantage, I mean, uh, at least uh, what I think is the main advantage is that the high energy of the X-ray absorption spectroscopy allows us to have a very, very high time resolution and allows us to probe really ultra fast processes so we can probe not only the ion dynamics, the nuclear dynamics, but also at the same time, we can probe the electron dynamics. So what we want to do with that is to probe 
the wave packet dynamics of the system when it is crossing a conical intersection. Okay, basically the simulations I will show you are uh, uh, you will see X rays in the K edge region, which is basically uh, all of the transitions that come from the one S core orbital and go to the balance orbitals. Okay, so basically the idea would be to probe the system while it is decaying through a conical intersection. Okay, well, I'm moving the other way. Yeah, so this is an example of a, 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 an ultra fast X ray absorption spectroscopy uh, spectrum. Okay, this is for the case of L glutamine. This is the system that is non fluorescent, the system that decays to the ground state. So let's try to understand what we see in this spectrum. So first we have two bands, two big bands, okay? One is associated to the excited state. So this is the UV excited state, okay? And this is, so this is the X-ray response of the UV excited state. And this is the X-ray response of the ground state, okay? So we see that at the beginning, we excite the system to the first excited state. So all of the population is in the first excited state. And as time goes, goes by, the system decays to the ground state. And the reason is that once we excite the system to the first excited state, the system moves forward to a very close by conical intersection that allows the system to relax to the ground state, okay? So in this first region, in this first region, we see the crossing between the two bands, okay? And we see the decay of the excited state into the ground state, okay? And what happens in the case of the L pyroglutamine ammonium, the system that contains a strong hydrogen bond? So, as I told you at the beginning, because the ground state potential energy surface is broadened, okay, uh, in the case of the strong hydrogen bond, the conical intersection lies further away and higher up in energy. So, it's more difficult for the system to reach this point, okay, and hence the lifetime of the system in the first excited state is much higher. So at least in this simulation time, uh, we don't see a decay of the, of the, of the band to the ground state. And maybe I, I skip <laughs> the part of describing the, the, the spectrum. So this, this line, this, uh, the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is energy, okay? So with this technique, we can differentiate the presence of a strong hydrogen bond with respect to a standard hydrogen bond, okay? So I think I don't have enough time to describe this part in detail, but I just wanted to mention that we developed a very, very simple uh, unsupervised machine learning approach in order to study both the electron and the nuclear dynamics along the conical intersection. So what is the system doing in order to transfer to pass the conical intersection, okay? So from a nuclear point of view, we observe that most of the motion is located around the hydrogen bond, okay? Again, this is the glutamine, the system that contains a standard hydrogen bond. And the main motion that the system does when it crosses the conical intersection can be separated in three parts. So one part is an intermolecular separation between the two, uh, hydrogen bond between the hydrogen bonded uh, molecules. Then there is a reduction of the strength of the hydrogen bond coupled to a CO stretching in the acceptor part, okay? And finally, there is a planarization of the amide carbon, okay? Uh, that is in the acceptor part. So all of these motions need to happen in order for the system to decay to the ground state. So if we hinder this motion, we would basically uh, 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 retard or, or, or delay the decay, okay? So the most important part of this motion is the motion of the hydrogen bond in, uh, uh, between the hydrogen bond in, uh, 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 molecules. And this is what I'm showing you here. So basically in the graph of your left, you see three histograms. So these are the histograms showing you the hydrogen bond strength for the ground state in black, the excited state in, in, in orange, and all of the points that are close to the conical intersection in blue. So there's something very interesting here. So 
when the system goes from the excited state to the ground state, the hydrogen bond strength decreases. So the hydrogen bond distance increases. But first, the hydrogen bond strength, before it goes to the ground state, it first increases. In the conical intersection, the hydrogen bond strength is the highest, and it is entering the region of the strong hydrogen bond. So here in pink, we see the region of strong hydrogen bonds. So we see that in the conical intersection, the system transiently behaves like a strong hydrogen bonding system, okay? And in the graph of your right, you see the same histogram, but evolving time. So you see how the system smoothly first go to the strong hydrogen bond region, and then it goes to the ground state uh, uh, hydrogen bond, okay? So this is very interesting because uh, this shows that in the spectrum, we can not only capture the presence of stable hydrogen bonds in the ground state, we can also capture the presence of transient hydrogen bonds that basically occur in the crossing region, okay? So when we see this crossing region, we are seeing the presence of transient strong hydrogen bonds, okay? So I think I don't have enough time to uh, talk about this in detail. This is, this is basically the electron dynamics okay, that also is, is, is uh, observed in the spectrum. Uh, but I, I think I will skip this part and I will go to the conclusion. So strong erosion bonds can delay the passage through conical intersections between the ground and the first excited state. Uh, and this retardation increases the lifetime, of course, in the first excited state. And this increments the probability of fluorescence. And also the PAM probe UV X-ray spectroscopy reveals the electronic and nuclear, well, I didn't talk about the electronic part, but just believe me, it does. The electronic and nuclear ultra fast dynamics along conical intersection showing a, a, a unique signature of the presence of strong hydrogen bonds, both, both uh, uh, stable and transient. So these are the people that participate in this work, mainly, I wanted to thank uh, Gonzalo who did most of the calculations and Ali. And uh, this all was done with the LEO code. LEO is a code that we developed in the University of Buenos Aires. It's a DFT code and uh, it's free and open source. And if you want to download it, uh, this is the webpage. So thank you. Thank you um, for this very interesting and fascinating presentation, the, which is now open for questions. Again, you can write in the chat or simply switch on your microphone. Had a question for Uriel? Um, I have a curiosity or yeah. possibly a nasty question again. Um, you convinced me that uh, when you go from a conventional to a strong hydrogen bond, uh, you increase the lifetime of the excited state. And this is good because this suggests that maybe the state can for us. But now the question is uh, the state that you calculate, the fluorescent state in which spectral region will fluoresce? Because uh, for me, the most uh, strange part of this result on uh, um, the anomalous fluorescence of this system is that, uh, again, you observe fluorescence in the visible region and not in the far ultraviolet. So can you clarify this point? No, I mean, it, it, it's just so. So the fact is that in the experiments, uh, we see that this fluorescence is visible. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, it shouldn't necessarily be the case, but in principle, this is what they what they observe. This is not so. We didn't focus on this part, uh, on, on the part of the of where the, the fluorescence comes. But uh, so what I can tell you is that this the the, the the so the part of the spectrum where the fluorescent uh, the fluorescence arise uh, is very consistent with also with the calculation. So so is is something that we are capturing in the calculation. So but so the explanation why it goes why it falls in this uh, part of the spectrum and not in another is something that I, I, I could not answer. And I think it's a very interesting thing to, to try to, to, 
to disentangle, to understand. But you say that you calculate more or less in the proper uh, spectral window. Yeah. This is already very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, questions? So uh, I do not see any. Do you see any more questions? Any more days end? It seems not. So, if uh, there are no more questions, uh, we can thank uh, Uriel and all the speakers of uh, this uh, last session.